Let's take a look at the book, Death of Ivan Ilyich. This one is by Lev Tolstoy. Tolstoy is one of the classic Russian authors. And if you don't know Russian literature, it is characterized by these long, huge, epic tomes of novels. But luckily for us today, this is not one of those huge epic tomes. This, by Russian standards, is a short story. The audiobook is about two and a half hours long, so that's not too bad. And it opens up with a man, Pyotr Ivanovich, going to the funeral of one of his work acquaintances, Ivan Ilyich. And the very first thing you notice in this book, this is something that if it were another book, I would save it to the end to talk about. But in this novel, it's just so plain and so in your face right away. It's how fake everyone is, how much they're just playing up to pretense and social expectation. Pretentious is a good word for it, actually. When all the people at Ivan's work get the news, the news that he's dead, that is, the first thing on everyone's mind is, how is this gonna shuffle around everyone's position? Who's gonna get to advance in their professional life because of this? Who's gonna get a raise? How much? And then when Ivanovich talks to Ivan's wife, what's the wife thinking of? Well, the wife is thinking of what kinds of social assistance programs are available through the government, what kinds of money she's able to get, and Ivan Ivanovich notices that the wife is already pretty educated on all this, but she was wondering if perhaps Ivanovich knew a little bit more, something that she didn't know, a little tidbit that she could squeeze a little more money out of the government. He ends that conversation, and he goes into the room where the body is being viewed, and then you even catch Ivanovich himself falling victim to this atmosphere of extreme pretense. He makes the sign of the cross, and he keeps making the sign of the cross on himself as he's entering the room. And he doesn't even know why he's doing it. He's doing it mostly because of social expectation. Now, after this first chapter, the book skips forward to the beginning of Ivan Ilyich's life and gives sort of a brief biography of the whole man, the whole life. He was a young adult in the 1860s, and from the outside looking in, he seems like a kind man, a just man, working his way through law school. Marries a woman named Priskovia Fyodorovna. That's a mouthful. And they have a good start to their marriage, but when she gets pregnant and the honeymoon phase is over and the hormones start setting in, they start having more arguments, and Ivan doesn't know how to react to these. So what he does is he just avoids his home life as much as possible and throws himself completely into his job. And even at the times when he has to spend time at home, often he tries to have a friend come visit the home with him so that there's a guest over, they have a good reason not to argue. They don't want to argue in front of the guest. And the novel says there are times where the couple actually does love each other, but more often than not they are arguing and unhappy with each other. And Ivan sort of cares more about what the professional world thinks of him, what high-class society thinks of him, than about what his family thinks of him. And he puts a lot of effort into maintaining this social image. So life goes on, business as usual, until the year 1880, where Ivan starts to realize that the family's expenses are catching up and surpassing what his income and his current job is able to get him. And in addition, he just feels passed over in his current job, so he goes out job hunting. And the book details his current income was... 3,500 rubles a year, and he needs 5,000 annually to live comfortably, at least. So he goes out job hunting, he finds a new position in Petersburg that does meet his income requirements, and he takes the job, and they start moving to a new town. But then something happens, something that the reader might not think much of when they first pass over this scene in the book. While he's moving something around, Ivan gets up on a ladder, remodeling, getting ready to move into the new house. He's on a ladder, and he bumps his left side, and it hurts him a little, but then he gets over it. But then and over time, he starts developing this pain, this illness in his side, and over time it starts debilitating him gradually more and more, and this is the beginning of the end for Ivan Ilyich. So he's getting sicker, he's living with this illness, he goes out to be diagnosed by one or two doctors, and in talking to these doctors, he realizes that the way the doctors talk to him, he sees himself in the doctors. In his day job, he's a judge in a court, and the way he talks to people, he cares more about his profession image than about the impact that his decisions have on people's lives. And he sees that same way of talking in how the doctors talk to him. They care about their professional image, and they don't care that their decisions and the way that they do their job is literally affecting people's health and sometimes life or death. So it feels like the doctor is putting on airs, so to speak. But in talking to this doctor, he gets the impression that things look very grim for his life. And he also gets the impression that the doctor does not much care about his life. Now, this is where the interesting parts of the book start coming along. Here's a quote from what Ivan is thinking to himself when he's in the carriage riding home after talking to this doctor. 
Quote, everything seemed dismal to Ivan Ilyich in the streets. The sledge drivers were dismal. The houses were dismal. The people passing and the shops were dismal. This ache, this dull, gnawing ache, which never ceased for a second, seemed, when connected with the doctor's obscure utterances, to have gained a new, more serious significance, with a new sense of misery. Ivan Ilyich kept watch on it now. End quote. Now, I like this quote a lot because it illustrates something that I've seen in one of Tolstoy's other books. That book is Anna Karenina. I actually have not read War and Peace yet, but it is on my list of things to read. But anyway, this thing, this commonality between these books by the same author is, he has a sort of beautiful way of taking the character's current mood, current mindset, and having that mindset be the lens through which they view everything around them. So if the character is distraught and doomful at that time, then of course everything around, all the houses around, all the streets and shops, they all look dismal. And if the character is elated, jubilant, then everything looks bright, glowing, happy. That's something that I really admire Tolstoy is able to do. But anyway, back to the book. Soon enough, Ivan gets sicker and sicker, and it gets to the point where he really shouldn't be going out anymore. Quote, he saw that he was dying and he was in continual despair, end quote. And at one point, he even tries to go to work, despite being in the state that he is. And he does this because work has always been the escape for him when uncomfortable things come around, when he's not happy with his family life, with his home life, he goes to work, and he's happy there. So he tries to go to work, tries to work through the pain, but soon enough it becomes obvious to everyone around that he's not doing okay, and he ends up going home as soon as he reasonably can without disrupting any cases that he's working on. He keeps getting worse, and soon enough he's bedridden, not really able to move around without help. And one of the things that really bothers him about being in that position is he knew he was dying, but it was sort of this unspoken thing. None of his family were willing to say it out loud, and then he wasn't either. Quote, he was made miserable by this lie, made miserable by them refusing to acknowledge what they all knew and he knew, by their persisting in lying to him about his awful position and forcing him to to take part in this lie, lying, lying, this lying carrying on over him on the eve of his death and destined to bring that terrible solemn act of his death down to the level of all their visits, curtains, sturgeons for dinner, was a horrible agony for Ivan Ilyich, end quote. Quote, this falsity around him and within him did more than anything to poison Ivan Ilyich's last days, end quote. But then, there's another character in this book. There is a servant boy who's a servant in the house. His name is Gerasim. Quote, Gerasim alone did not lie, end quote. And we see Gerasim being one of the few and only comforts to this dying man, even going as far as... It's mentioned in the book that when Ivan was laying down and when his feet were elevated a certain way, the pain was much easier on him. And Gerasim even went as far as sitting with Ivan's feet on his shoulders for an extended period of time, not going to bed until late, staying like this for a very long time, even despite Ivan saying, it's okay, it's okay, you can go to bed now. No, it's okay, I'll stay, I don't mind. And one time Ivan actually asked him why he took so much trouble to care for this dying man. And the response, quote, we shall all die, so what's a little trouble, which the character Ivan took to mean, quote, he did not complain of the trouble just because he was taking the trouble for a dying man, and he hoped that for him too, someone would be willing to take the same trouble when his time came, end quote. Now, Gerasim was the nighttime servant of the house, and the daytime servant, a boy named Piotr, was not sympathetic in the same way. Ivan feels like he's just an obstacle to Piotr's goal of cleaning the room. He feels like just some piece of dead weight that Piotr has to go around in order to clean, and that adds to the atmosphere of insincerity. As he gets closer to the end, he starts to examine his life as a whole, and he goes through all of his memories from beginning to end, and he realizes is that the further he gets from childhood and the closer he gets to the present, he finds less genuine happiness to all of his memories, more superficial pretense. Quote, as if I had been going steadily downhill, imagining I was going uphill. So it was, in fact. In public opinion, I was going uphill, and steadily as I got up it, life was ebbing away from me. And now the work's done. There's only to die. End quote. Wow, what a grim way to live life. And in his reminiscing on his life and thinking about how much meaning his life had or didn't have, he starts to center around this one core question, did I live life the way I ought to have lived it? Quote, can it be I had not lived as one ought? Unquote. And he goes through everything he did in his entire life, and he concludes that he did everything the quote-unquote correct way. He did everything 
correctly for his standing in society. He cannot find a single thing that was flawed in the way he lived his life. And because he refuses to admit that he did not live life as he ought to have, he reaches the conclusion, the absolutely grim conclusion, that life is a series of meaningless sufferings going with increasing velocity towards the end. And there is this feeling of immense emptiness that goes along with that. And that emptiness almost forces him to completely reconsider that point. And he gradually starts to realize that the way high society, the way he has to live to preserve his status in high society, might not have been the actual correct way to live life. So he's on his deathbed with no time left and no one to lie to, not even himself. No time left for lies to even be worth anything. He's realizing now that he can't lie to himself anymore. And he spends hours and days wrestling with this, until it gets to a point where it's just two hours before his death, and he starts to ask himself, is there still time for me to live as one ought to live? And then, that begs the very next question he asks himself, what would be the right thing for me to do next? And at that point, he starts to wake up from a half-delirious haze to realize that his young son is by his bedside kissing his hand. And at the sight of this, he instantly realizes that his agony agony is torturing his family, and the thing that he concludes is the right thing to do is to tell his family to go away. And very weakly, he does his best to get the words out, he asks his family to forgive him. Now, after his wife and his son leave, he's alone in the room, and he realizes something. He realizes he's lost his terror of death, and he feels lighter than he even would have expected. And he takes note of his body and how his body feels. Yes, the pain is still there, but, quote, what of it? Let the pain come, unquote. And then, two hours later, two hours hours of screaming in agony, such screaming as his wife said at the beginning, could be heard through three closed doors. After two hours of agony, Yvonne finally passes away. So what can we extract from this book? If anyone out there hadn't caught on yet, this is one of the most powerful defenses of Christianity that I have read, and impressively it does it without explicitly quoting scripture or mentioning God all that much. It is a story that very, very, very clearly illustrates the main point that the author was trying to get across, and I love how skillfully this message was wrapped up in this piece of fiction. That's something I love about Tolstoy. About lots of Russian authors, really. It's the idea of, I mentioned before, when you're on your deathbed, when there's no room, no sense in making excuses anymore, when there's nothing left to do except take a hard, honest look at your life, what are you going to see there? Are you going to be happy? Happy with the way that you lived when time runs out. And that right there, that is the heart of what God and Christianity and the Sermon on the Mount, it's the heart of what all of this is all about. People can spend as much time as they want debating whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, whether any of that is real, talking about whether or not scripture forbids or allows this or that, but the real question at the root of it, are you going to be happy with your life in those final hours? That is the question that brought me to God, and I am extremely happy to see Tolstoy lay it out in such a beautifully illustrated and concise way. This book really is a work of art. And something I'll contrast that mindset to, the, the idea of living life as you should and being satisfied at the end, Contrasting to that is one of Yvonne's conclusions in his gradually evolving sense of what life is all about. It was the quote about life being a series of meaningless sufferings going with increasing velocity towards the end. And it's easy to conclude that if all you're living for is momentary pleasure, if all you're living for is comfort and felicity. Remember felicity, that word that comes up a lot on this channel, as opposed to deeper joy. Well, felicity runs out when the pain comes, and as people get older, as our bodies give us more aches and pains, there's going to be a lot more pain that comes, both physical and emotional. And if all all you're living for is the moment, the comfort, the fleeting joy of the moment, then it's gonna be really, really hard at the end of your life, and it's gonna seem like life is a series of fleeting, meaningless sufferings. So there's got to be something more that you search for, there's got to be some reason, something else you live for, some thing that you can have, that you can use as a guidepost along your way to orient your actions in this life. Something that can truly make you, as a human being, as an emotional creature, something that can satisfy those self-doubts and really help you be confident in saying, I have lived life the way one ought. 
that, I believe, more than anything, is the core message that the author wanted to get across in this book. Now, a couple things I did want to mention, having read first this book, and then the huge tome of Anna Karenina by the same author, and then coming back to this book, there's a couple more quirks of this author, a couple more commonalities between the books of his that I've read that I just want to make note of. First is the way the author writes about the peasantry. Someone else actually pointed this out to me, and then I started seeing it more thinking back on things of his that I've read. Tolstoy had this idea that the peasants were more moral and upright, and the aristocracy tended to be more corrupt. But despite thinking this, Tolstoy was in fact born into the aristocrat class. And then I'll compare it to the character of Levin from Anna Karenina, which a lot of people think that Levin was basically a self-insert into that book. Levin is an aristocrat, but he pays a lot of attention to the peasantry and how they think and what they do. And he even makes it a point to spend time out in the fields working as the peasants work, working alongside them. And then bringing it back to this book, we see the character of Gerasim, who comes from the peasant class, but he's the only one in this entire book, aside from Ivan at the very end, who's not completely caught up with being pretentious. And something else I want to note, in both of the Tolstoy books that I've read, there's a good amount of attention given to dying characters, characters that are on their deathbed. In Anna Karenina, it's the brother of Levin, and in that book, the brother's long, gradual death is used as an opportunity for Tolstoy to have Kitty, Levin's new wife, sort of demonstrate demonstrate to her new husband, demonstrate her competence, and that she's ready and able to take on these mature things in life. And she does this by being an absolutely amazing bedside nurse to Levin's brother. And I just want to say, Tolstoy almost certainly knows what he's talking about firsthand when he writes about the experience of those who are near death. But overall, this was an absolutely amazing book. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I would absolutely recommend reading it.